Right. Reading books I have found. I've read most of the notes, so uh, I won't won't go through these now. I think I've read all of them while I was playing. Yes, I'm pretty sure of it. But the books, books I haven't read, apart from uh, maybe Havelock, Havelock's entries. There's a lot of books here. The Trials of Aptitude, I found this all the way back in the prison. Once a child shows the proper inclination, he is marked. Overseers are assigned to study the subject surreptitiously in order to determine whether this inclination is supported by cosmological conditions and other signs. Ongoing throughout the year, at the end of the cycle, those befitting further testing are removed from their homes some hours before dawn and must begin the march to an outpost outside the city. There, the children undergo ritual preparation and evaluation until the last night of the month of rain, when they make a pilgrimage to Whitecliff. During an elaborate ceremony, it is determined which of the children will become overseers and which must be put down. Mm -hmm. Damien's journal. Right, I found this from the from the couple in the sewers. Yes, this this one I read back then. Sokol of technology and the new age. One of the advantages of the Sokolov's technologies is that they share the same magnetic socket for the tanks of processed whale oil they use as fuel. When a tank is exhausted, another one can be plugged into place with ease, and the process is simple enough that any common workman and the lower guardsman of the city watch can handle the task. This applies to the arc pylon and wall of light security systems, as well as powered carriages used for transport by those few who are wealthy enough to afford them. The only obvious downside of Sokolov's designs is the volatility of the tanks themselves. Few incidents have occurred resulting in damage to property and bodily harm whenever one of the tanks has exploded. So we are getting a background information and tips for the gameplay in case we want to utilize that somehow. A second solution about Biro. Piero's elixir, I guess. I, I don't really remember anymore if I read the books or not before, so I will just read them all. It is through no fault of my own that the average citizen has expressed a preference for Sokolov's elixir over my own formula. Sold as Piero's remedy, a name I did not choose, if you must know the truth, the public has spoken its usual message of idiocy, spending their coin as a means of selecting Sokolov's formula over mine, which I believe to be equal if not superior. Much has been made over the popularity of these concoctions as a means of resisting this remarkable new plague. I say remarkable because this strain works with an efficiency we have not seen in the history of the Empire. This plague, now making its way through the city of Dunwall, is unrivaled in its effectiveness. I have studied it within the blood of those so afflicted, and it is nearly perfect, elegant in fact. And while it is true that Piero's remedy and Sokolov's elixir are known to protect the body against the plague equally, my own has properties not fully understood which relate to the mind itself and the spirit. And it is this way that my formula wins out. Here is where one should pay attention to this contest. For you see, Sokolov's elixir, with its emphasis on the brute animal body, is a grass coo better suited for livestock. The subtle and secret variance in the key ingredients making up Piro's remedy ensure that it works on the higher functions that separate humankind from the mindless blue jawed hackfish swimming in the Renhaven River. And yes indeed, Piro's remedy gives back mana and Sokolov's elixir gives back health. What is interesting in here is that how the plague is nearly perfect. Elegant, in fact. There is no 
the, there are very rare things in nature that are perfect. So I am 75% sure that this plague was engineered by men. But uh, I guess we'll find out that later. Dead counter responsibilities. Commissioned by the Lord Regent in the face of the growing plague crisis, the dead counter is a position that will only be given to officers, usually of junior or middle grades, in most matters of edict or carfer enforcement, those officers will defer to the acting officer on duty. However, any dead counter will have command in situations related to the plague and the handling of the dead, including those with late-stage plague symptoms, called weepers in common parlance. Starting in the month of rain, interested officers may apply for the, for the test and, if accepted, for two-week training tour. Pay will be administered in coin and rations of elixir at one and, at one, and one half normal pay grade. Failed experiments. Excerpt from a series of lectures on natural philosophy by Piero Joplin. Of course, I have attempted to improve upon Sokolov's designs. Of course, and why not? After all, it is likely that his thinking was influenced in some small way by our time together at the Academy. We are all part of a community striving to unknot the mysteries of the cosmos. Even those among us who possess the greatest minds are often led to a fruitful line of consideration by, how does one say it, our intellectual subordinates. Sokolov is no exception to this, despite the glamour of genius he has cast over the aristocracy. And further, it is true that many of my experiments have failed. No need to gossip about it behind my back in your social clubs and in the very chambers of the academy itself. Great ambition requires risks. You may laugh now at my door to nowhere, but someday you will not. Your children will likely see it as commonly as you see the electric lamps lighting our streets at night, but a very short years ago you would have laughed at Sokolov's arc pylon or wall of light. Your laughter, your condescending smiles, they are nothing but evidence of your own limited imagination. Whale Vive Section Remarkably, each specimen I had the pleasure of studying during the Voyage possessed some minor variance in physiology. On the second leg of the trip east of Thivia, the crew hauled aboard a female some 42 meters in length. I estimate she weighed 35 tons and the ship sat low, rocking side to side through the night with her fressing. By candlelight I took her apart, sketching and taking notes. Against her bellowing I got into the mass of tentacles around her mouth. Within I found row upon row of teeth and a baleen running along the upper jaw. Through this broom-like structure I assume she filtered food from the water that was too small to be chewed. Whale oil processing. Out at sea, they secured the beast with hooks, with lines cast from the main ship and from several smaller boats. Boys keep the whale from diving deep. Once it's caught, a larger hook is driven through the tail, which is used to hoist the creature up through the chute. They moan and bellow for, the, some, for some time as the men get onto the deck, then lift them into the scaffolding overhead. The ship adjusts its brow and returns to port in Dunwall, where the crew works on the great creature, slicing off the fattiest parts while it still lives. Quite, quite cruel. Admiralty and the fleet. While each of the isles has some form of naval fleet, none is more envied than that of Crystal, with its long proud history of great ships and admirals who command them. Boys come of age in the cities of Crystal hoping to someday captain such a ship, and family dynasties are made by those captains who track down infamous pirates and cross cross uprisings as during the Morley insurrection. 
In times of war and peace, Crystal continues to innovate at sea. The ship designs of Anton Sokolov himself now represent the highest standard in the whaling trade, allowing crews to haul their kill over the deck and begin their butchery and processing, even as the ship returns to Dunwall. The crews can be seen working on their latest whale as the ship moves slowly up the Renhaven River, coming to dock with one of the powerful warehouse companies, such as the Greaves Whaling House. Suspended in the rigging overhead and backlit by settling sun, the silhouette of one of those creatures makes a moving sight as it cruises to its final resting place in the industrial heart of the capital city. Yes, indeed, we've seen several of those several of those ships moving down the up and down the river. A Gaffer's Tale, Volume One. A Gaffer's Tale, or A Gaffer's Early Adventures. My sister Nina and I left Divya together, saying goodbye to our aunt, the woman who had raised us since childhood, leaving behind our home city of Yaro and the cold but beautiful white landscapes we had always known. We boarded a ship for Dunwall, our parents had left us with a sizable inheritance, and we spent half of this getting to the capital city and establishing a small import shop dedicated to Tivian furs. Once I'd helped Nina establish the business, I was free to pursue my dream. Signing on with the whaling ship was most was the most exciting thing I'd ever done, and I saw it as a means to an end. Someday I would captain my own crew and eventually own a fleet of similar vessels. With tears in her eyes, Nina kissed me farewell, and I did not see her again for many months. As an apprentice to the Kaffir, I got to see the trackling and killing of the great beasts up close. Nothing had ever fired my spirit so as the wind and pounding waves, racing after a wounded whale, being pulled by a skein of cables embedded in its thick flesh. I changed more in those first seven months than I had in the previous seven years. Whaling was beginning to put its mark on me so that Nina barely recognized me even recognized me when I returned, tanned and sinewy with muscle, with her creases already wrinkling the corners of my eyes. But she could see that I was filled with joy, having found my purpose. Gaffer's Tale, Volume 2, or A Gaffer's Final Passage after more than a quarter of a century, I'm done with whaling, too broken to continue. I've seen all the corners of the isles and made more coin than most men see in a lifetime. But it's all gone. I lived through an emperor and watched his daughter take the throne. Fair young, young empress she was, but slain so young. Everything beautiful comes to die. I've eaten in every port of the known world and sailed in the loneliest waters you could imagine. I've seen the cliffs around Pandisia. Even the best of it doesn't give me an ounce of joy. The years come back across my dreams as a line of butchered bodies, long, sleek and singing among the waves under the moonlight, only to be spread by ugly, weather-scarred men whose knife each other for a good pair of boots. Each year I had less time to come home. My tongue forgot the language of small chatter and those who lived in the cities thought me odd. My sister Nina hardly knew what to say to me during our visits. When she lost her business to the Lord Regent's crooked banister, barrister, I was a hundred miles east of Morley. Gaff hand frozen from the sleet as we tracked the first bull whale we'd seen in months. I helped her as much as I could, but Nina died in the early days of the plague. None of it mattered. If I'm jaded and bitter, it's because this industry has taken away my dreams. The world has beaten me. The Gaffer's Tale was a sad tale. The 
Shadow on Bitterleaf. Finding my way. By the feeble light of the dying fire, I saw her working. A large needle moved in her hand, following precise esoteric patterns, knots and loops of seamstress craft from the ancient days. Beneath her needle, his body glanced and shuddered, shaking the wooden table. A morbid fascination pushed me closer until she turned her blank face toward me, resting the needle in his flesh. With a refined tone, she addressed me. So you are the lover, I presume? You too have been unfaithful and it is now your turn to be mended. I wouldn't mind reading the rest of this longer work of fiction. The Young Prince of Thivia, excerpt from a theater play, starring Lord Nathan Bale and Prince Colisar. How dare you, sir, clothed so in my very home? I should hand you over to the watch, depraved Thivian. That's a harsh welcome for a royalty, my lord. Your daughter treated me with much more hospitality. Alas, she has gone out for the evening, leaving me all alone. What are you doing? Leave this house. Go back to the f to go back to your frozen wasteland, pale rascal. No need for anger between us, Lord Bale. Is it so wrong for me to be here? As I've proven, I've developed an affinity for you and your family. Oh my, Kalisar, your skin is so warm, it burns. Unexpected ending and plot on that play. Moving on. Litany on the White Cliff. And I say to you, brothers, it is here that we make our stand as a righteous force against the growing darkness. It is here that we unite against the spirits of the unknown that would drag us screaming into the night, never to return to our homes, to our families. Together we will serve as a rod to those who would stray from the herd, for the foggy grey wastes of the outsider. We will burn a bright fire with our virtuous actions so that others will not lose their way. And that those who choose to wander beyond the walls of our homes in far places, we will strike at them swiftly before they whisper to their neighbors, filling their hearts with the strangeness and doubt. From a series of overseer invocations by High Overseer Abram Templeton. Harpooner songs. Right, I'm not going to not going to sing this one. This was uh, back in the trailer. We can uh, hear people whistling that around the missions. The Fook Feast. Mm. At the end of every year, after the last day of month of songs, we begin the Fook Feast. The new year has not started and thus the time that follows is outside the calendar. A period of celebration and feasting begins, during which the people abandon the very practices that keep them whole and healthy over the year. Many leave their homes euphoric with spirits or potent herbs. Some paint their faces or wear masks to conceal themselves as they pursue their passions without reservation. When the right cosmological signs are observed and it is time for the calendar to begin anew, the sitting, o the sitting high overseer calls for the hymn of atonement and the folk feasts end. Families return to their homes, wives to their husbands, enemies put down their weapons and fires are extinguished. No complaint is given for those who have wronged others, deviated from ancient codes or discarded oaths. For this time during the astrological alignment does not exist and is not recorded. The following day starts the new year, marked on the first day of the month of Earth and it has as it has always been. Yeah, I remember commenting 
about this when I uh, when I found the book. I think how it's very interesting that they have this period period of time or period where time does not exist between each year. And uh, during that time, uh, anything anything goes. Very interesting, uh, kind of uh, how how this world works. Call this Fierce Volume One. Do I happen to have more volumes? No, but I have a lot of books, a lot of books to go. All right, let's leave. Call this Fierce Volume One. My stomach twisted as the en engines of the odd vessel rode louder. It was the creation of Orcado, third prefect from the Academy of Natural Philosophy. He was exhilarated, savoring each of the small craft's undulations. Orcado pulled a lever and a great gout of smoke surrounded us. The smell of burning whale oil grew unbearable as the machine propelled itself upward. I was too afraid to look through the window which suddenly didn't feel thick enough. As if knowing my thoughts, Overseer Brun looked at me and smiled. Recite some of the litany, my pupil. It will protect your heart from the turpitude of the void on our way to the outer spheres. Mm -hmm. The exquisite tall boy. Haven't seen any of those yet in the missions. What you've read here is the truth, regardless of what you will hear from the authorities who rule us. It's not a matter of coincidence that the former royal spymaster is the one who stepped in when the late empress fell. We, who will remain nameless, believe that these events are interconnected. The signs of oppression are all around us. The circle of designs, originally intended to prov provide light and warmth in our homes, have been turned against us as a means of inspiring fear and controlling our movements through the city. And where did this plague originate? Some say it was imported. A wild theory? Perhaps. One of our members risked her life to obtain an internal report from the government, which we will be printing and sharing soon, called The Exquisite Doll Boy, extolling the virtues of this newest member of the City Watch. To those in the streets below, these virtues are horrors, spread by stilted thugs who rain down fire on the sick and the poor. To these eyes, the doll boy is another government bully, Armed with incendiary devices, thickly armored and standing high overhead, looking down at the common people of the city. We now know that the tall boys are heavily drugged, imbibing, imp a substance that renders them resistant to pain, but also dulls whatever empathy they might normally possess. Exquisite? We think not. Copy these words and share them with your neighbors, and remember, when the tides are lowest, the truth will be revealed. Death in the Month of Songs Kind of a poem, I guess? She was shy in the month of hearts, hiding from my scented letters a sun-dappled cure for my loneliness. She was smiling in the month of rain, eating figs straight from the tree, a dream of sailing around the isles. She was wet in the month of glance, to her sailor cousin from Culero, a shrill bird drilling at my chest. She was dying in the month of songs, struck by a disease from the east, a terrible kiss on her distant lips. Mother's Journal Eighth Entry It's the fourth day of the month of rain. Morris is sick and so are the children. I have avoided it thus far, which is good fortune since it has fallen on me to take care of them. To care for them. The city watch comes and goes, knocking on doors, asking for signs of plague. Even our neighbors cannot be trusted. Earlier it was difficult to keep the children quiet, now they sleep most of the time. 
The flies have set in, I try to keep them away, but I can barely get close, they sting so. Most of the time, Morris won't answer me when I try to talk to him from across the room. Morris is gone. I don't know what I'll do. For now, all my hope is reserved for the children, leaving the flat for a while near dawn. I found some plague bags from a card booth while no one was around. It took me took a while, but I got Morris into one of the bags. At least his face is covered. Young Robert has passed. The star of my sky is gone. Page missing. 17th entry. Ellie stopped breathing in the middle of the night. She was such a headstrong girl, I can hardly believe she was overcome. She was always near as I got hackfish or vegetables, arguing with me about everything. It's the fourth day of the month of wind. It has settled in that they are lost to, lost to me, all of them. I cannot bring myself to call the dead counter. I have the fever now. No guards come near anymore. On a lighter note about bone charms, a sailor's blessing, they say. The carving itself is a practice from long back, passed from father to son, old man salt to greenhorn, still getting his sea legs beneath him. In the old times, men cut into the tusks of ice seals and into the arm-long fangs of bears that roamed the isles north of Thivia. Once the whale trade began, the practitioners went to engraving the bones of those great beasts, rendering charms that sing in the night and grant some small boon to a man's vigor or defense against pregnancy. Dr. Calvani's journal, we already read, found the combination to his safe. Sewer capacity in the month of nets by City Works crew. I've been asked to tell the problem, so here it is. It's been every year that we work like men gone mad during the month of nets. I don't hardly, I don't hardly see my family. It's bad enough that the works is clogged with grass from the catch, pieces of grates and nets, but the water smells of hackfish guts too. We got to get it done before the month of rain, or you know what. And it ain't like we get help from those bricks of in civil engineering either. Been at this job nigh on 28 years, and I never seen one of them come below, except to measure will it hold when they go putting up one of their fancy new bridges. So these last three years be so these last three years been the worst, and here's why. It's the river crusts moved into the works. We hear a man head yell and scream, like he's burning up, and we all climb up fast. No other choice. Right, the weepers. Oh, wow, there's a lot of books. Mm, I think I will be reading these... Uh, I'll be reading these um, more as I go on after this, but I want to I want to read this all now. Rat behavior and extermination. It used to be you'd go out with a bag, a stick with a nail on the end and catch as many rats as you could in the night. The city watch paid by weight. My husband Benjamin and I mostly worked alone and we got by. If we found a place where the rats were real bad, sometimes we'd hire a crew of street rats to work with us, the younger ones who didn't make the trop who didn't make trouble. We'd pay them with bread and apple cider. Once the plague came, the rats were different, meaner, bigger, and little quicker. You had to watch yourself. If you got cornered, they'd turn and the swarm would come back at you. I barely got away with my skin a few times down in the sewers. The bites hurt afterward, but it was the sounds they made that stayed in your dreams at night. It got more dangerous and the city watch started paying better, but that didn't last long because after a while too many people had been stripped clean, trying to fill up a bag. One slip and they'd be all over you, gnawing and trying to chew down to the bone. That's how I lost my poor Benji. 
the Rat Plague. For over a year, I've studied this cursed plague, collecting and dissecting rats by the thousands. Given their rapid gestation and maturation cycle, it's been possible to breed them for numerous generations. The rodents themselves seem immune to the plague, but they pass it readily between members of their own species, perhaps through mites. The blood of the rats tells its own story, allowing me to gauge up the number of generations that a given group of rats have lived with the plague. As such, a nagging question remains. The rats collected in the poorest parts of town, in the slums, exhibit the oldest strains of the plague, while those found near the docks, where the foreign plague-bearing rats would presumably have entered our city, exhibit a younger strain of plague. Could this mean that the rats were transported to the slums in some way that is not obvious? I will continue my research. If nothing else, I am a living proof that Sokolov's elixir and Piero's remedy are very effective at protecting against the plague if one consumes enough of the stuff. Yeah, second second clue that the plague was at least planted into the city by men or by someone, something, I don't know. The Leviathan Sorrow. Little is known of Pakoti, credited with this series of pamphlets arguing against the whaling trade. While he is gifted, his views are nonsense and threatened economic underpinnings of the empire. Excerpt from a report on a treaty spent by the Rudshore Trade Council. 1. Enslavement. On the breeding and husbanding of whales versus hunting the beasts in the wild after a natural and free life cycle, Pakoti offers no solutions for where these massive male malevolent creatures might be bastard. Dissolution. Layments on the destructions of social bonds between herd members. Pakoti actually uses the term families. Harmony. Drivel on the aesthetic, aesthetic wonder of what is, in reality, the great and terrible ocean that ever threatens to swallow us, includes arguments on the gentle nature of the brutes, a notion refuted by seamen, who return to shore wide-eyed with the tales of the whale's savagery. Disruption. Here, Pagotti is on his weakest footing, issuing up feverish warnings against the displacement or transference of natural beasts from their native environments. Kind of a, um, kind of a green piece kind of thing. Uh, those uh, those uh, caring for the animals, caring, uh, uh, worry, worried about the balance of nature. I like this. Very nice. Very nice touch to them. That's the whole whole word. Timeless Children's Rhymes Excerpt from a set of cautionary tales for children. They say that Jimmy Whitcomb Riley was a brawler his mate, mates called Smiley. He ran around up and down town, pulling off every kind of crime. On Bottle Street he hung with boys. He hang with boys, throwing bricks and bottles at other toys. They'd start a fight, then run and hide breaking laughing far and wide. Smiley liked to eat and drink all day, and smash and bash the night away. Drunk and all alone, he drifted off sleeping, sitting on the bridge along John Clavering. When he woke, something strange he found, stranger than a singing wolfhound. He'd become a blue-chawed hackfish most Smiley, and only remembered his, na only remembered his name was Smiley. They say that Jimmy Whitcomb Riley was never seen again for all of time. But he swam around, up and down, drinking from the river, crying, why me? Hmm. Okay. 
Distillery District. Across the empire, Old Dunwall whiskey is not only the finest liberation of its kind, but it's also an important cultural tradition among discerning folk, sophisticated and common alike. Captains moving their ships across the great ocean always have a puddle in their quarters for occasions. Fine restaurants and bars keep it in stock, and farmers across Crystal exchange Old Dunwall whiskey when healthy children are born. Some might disagree, preferring highbrow with highbrow drinks just such as King Street Brandy or one of the other brands from Morley. But sales of Old Dunwall have been brisk through the early years of Empress Jasmine Goldwyn's reign, a trend that is expected to continue. Aged and bottled in Dunwall's distillery district, Old Dunwall whiskey is what you want. Elixir accounts was uh, slack jaw saw the Puddle Street Gang's book on who's using their bootleg elixir. Kernau's visit. I read this. Kind of interesting. Interesting that this is in the books. Isn't this kind of a note? Whelping and training hounds. From each litter, there's usually somewhere shy of four good pups, but we always drown the runt. Them that remain spend three or so months suckling from their mothers before we start them up with the training. It's simple at first, returning sticks and sitting still on command, only pissing outside and the like. But by the eighth month, we got them hunting for scented sack dolls hidden in the hidden in a shrub forest, killing wild pigs on command, and taking a man in padded armor down by hanging onto his forearm. At the end of the first year, we graduate the ones that, that have learned, and shoot the ones that haven't. The overseers take them after, after that, and we never see them again, except once. Walking down Clavering Boulevard, an overseer passed me, preaching about the litany on the white cliff, and the evils of witchery, and sure enough, his hound started whimpering and wagging its tail. That's how I knew it was one of mine, whelped up from a pup. And then we have the seven strictures. Mm. I read this when I was opening the Opening the locked room down in the kennels. And I think I also read the seven stricture and the fourth stricture. Yes. Oh well, maybe I will read them all at once when I found them all. Uh, still whole lot go. There's there's a shitload of books in this game. Man. And I'm only I'm only two missions through. The Great Trials. Spending two years in the company of heretics, the insane, and those rare black-hearted villains who were truly pra practitioners of magic. I can say with truth that I have seen such things as to break the minds of most, while the trials and burning way heavily upon my heart, I must chronicle what has been a unique opportunity to witness the multifarious perversions that the outsider bestows upon those who seek his black counsel. Again, something from the High Overseer. Many of those we faced were accused of bewitching their neighbors or family, controlling them from afar and even walking around in their skins. And I have seen this with my own eyes, as one woman slid into the form of another, prowling unseen until a vigilant overseer struck down both witch and her host. Others, detailed herein, were found to stand in two places seemingly at once, or to vanish from one place and appear in another. Our work was dire, we knew, for if the followers of the outsider can truly inhabit the skin of another, or move from place to place like the wind, then how can we hope to erect walls to keep him out? It was these trials that first led us to investigate barriers beyond the physical. 
Mm -hmm. Indeed. Bone charm situation. I was asked, should we not tolerate the possession of simple bone charm charms among the populace? Surely this is a trivial matter, merely a cultural practice seen across the aisles, not as terrible as the creation and coveting of more complex occult runes. Such an insidious question. This foolish distinction weakens our mission while the stench of the outsider grows thick around us. Perhaps, as some claim, our ancestors tolerated these cursed practices during the times before our modern empire arose, to ease the lives of the lowliest serfs as they paved roads to civilization. But there is no excuse for witchery in this brighter industrial age. Having a adjudicated the trials of many heretics myself, I swear that their eyes, as the clarity of pain took their lives, were grateful to be liber liberated. Is that so? The ancient music. Yes, I found this in the workshop in the backyard of the High Overseer's office. Metaphysical Mysterium. It is said that we should not sully our hands when com combating the forces of the void. My studies have been deemed heretical by my brothers, but the rewards have been invaluable. I have harnessed the same energies employed by the outsider and his accursed followers while avoiding their corruption. I will prescribe a twofold method in this text. Indirection. As the unwholesome powers of the outsider use living flesh as a conduit, we can avoid being tainted by using the flesh of others instead. Containment. By using channels and barriers, we can focus these void energies in a raw state, shielding them from the perverse perspectives of the outsider. Speaking of the outsider, Excerpt from the diary of a known heretic seized before his execution. For most, the outsider is nothing but a child's tale meant to instill fear of that beyond the family, the community. When I was young, my mother and I were on the run, moving from one village or sea town to the next, camping in the woods for weeks, always with the cursed overseers at our backs. At night, she told me of her dreams, of the empty place where outsider whispered to her. With each visit, her craft grew, until she could see through the eyes of moths and unlock a door or window latch from outside a house. I will find this empty place. Somehow the key to open the void will fall into my hands. In time, I will learn the secret and he will call to me as he called to her. Call me a heretic for my studies, drag me to your cold stone cell, whip my flesh and put me on trial as an apostate, burn my body to ash. But I will continue to seek the realm of which my mother spoke. It is my life's meaning. There is the sixth stricture. Yeah, I think it makes more sense to read all all of those at once when I when I find them. Customs and food of Morley. Born and raised in Crystal, I spent my formative years in our smaller cities before settling in magnificent Dunwall. There, in the capital city, I learned to learned to appreciate the finer things. When the opportunity arose to document my travels to Sergonos, TV, and finally Morley. I left my position as a clerk for the late Lord Estermont. Perhaps, like so many in Dunwall, I suffer from being excessively cultured, but I found Morley disappointing. Over the course of this journal, I will explain why I found the festival of churners to be tiresome despite the high banners, bare feet and red robes, and why the renowned jellied ox tongue is something I will be struggling to forget for many years to come. Mm. 
Mysteries of Pandisia. At the Academy of Natural Philosophy, they speak of the Pandisian continent as a place of wonder, where all of life has entwined and blossomed across, across aeons, producing a vibrant ecology unrivaled in the civilized world. The overseers from the Abbey of the Everyman, by contrast, talk of horror and heresies, of cults of submen engaged in brutal perverse rituals. The few who have traveled to the far continent and come back to the isles, those who have actually touched the soil there, have returned with notes that describe vast deserts, deep jungles and outlandish creatures that defy belief. Once in a generation, a great effort is mounted to build a colony there, in hopes of this someday growing into a port city to rival Dunwell itself. But to date, these attempts have all ended in madness and failure. Looting in recent months. Excerpt from a letter found in an empty house at the edge of Rat Shore Financial District. The looting started in the warehouses. Once enough men, men took sick with the plague, the companies had to suspend operations. My husband Malgus was with the Mayerson Tobacco Leaf Company, which closed last year during the month of glance. glance. He ran the fireboxes at the main curing barn. Malkus always said flu curing made the sweetest leaf. Sickness hits the tobacco men hardest because of all the smoking. They ran with a small crew for a while, but around the time my husband got sick, the fires were put out and the tobacco sat rotting. Somehow the thieves knew and started tripping the place. Later they moved on to the houses, the bastards. Missing Women, Golden Cat Mr. Arrowhoff, I assure you, my family has the means to pay you and your associates should you locate my sister. You've got her name and description, everything else we know about her initial weeks in Dunwall before Patrice stopped writing to me. However, there is one other detail so hard to believe that I was reluctant to mention it. There is an establishment within Dunwall called the Golden Cat, a bathhouse, I believe, though some say it's a brothel. I find it implausible that Patrice would ever be connected with such a place, but I would be remiss if I did not pass along the information. Just before her letter stopped coming, the cousin of an old friend said he saw Patrice performing there, singing and playing the harp. It could be nothing, but please investigate. Lastly, if your search of the city has not borne fruit by the month of wind, I will be making the trip from Morley myself in order to retain another agent. Sincerely, Madison Kane Bright. Excerpt from a crime story revolving around the Golden Cat. Hmm. Golden Cat quest guest ledger. There's no interesting thing there. Weeper identification and handling. Once excerpt from notes by Dr. Calvani on proper procedure for handling those infected with the plague. Once a victim bleeds from the eyes, you cannot help them. Death is inve inevitable, given our current understanding of the plague. However, by following protocol, we can limit its spread. All personnel handling weepers, or those in the final stages, must consume liberal amounts of the one of the available protective potions. Any of the variants will serve this purpose, Sokolov's elixir or Piero's remedy, for instance. A dose per day for the enlisted men, a dose twice daily for officers. Distance must be maintained either through the use of pole arms or incendiary ranged weapons, in order to avoid the parasitic stinging insects that colonize an infected host. After use, strict washing procedures must be followed with regard to washing the metal kennels, transport paddocks and the carriages used to transport the infected to one of the deportation zones, such as the flooded district. Hmm, I'm not looking forward in going to the flooded, flooded district with that in mind. 
Oh, another theater play, Daughter of Tivia. Young Lady Amelia and Duchess Cully. With Young Lady Amelia starting. Duchess, I do not know of the world beyond these scarring walls, but do not mistake my lack of experience for fear or for absence of desire. Oh, I can't read it like that. If I've avoided you, it's because of the warning your name carries. And what warning is that, my dear Amelia? I believe you know my meaning. Your father's tales are still subject of parlor gossip. And do those stories excite you? Tell me, girl. I am a friend. That's a scully. I... Yes, I confess they do. In my youth I hid a copy of the tales of Blin's Kalisar, and I read them late into the night. As did I. But he was your father. They're just stories, Amelia. Fire for the imagination. Duchess, will you teach me to kiss? I will, but have you never kissed another? My ladies, I swear to you I did not intend to spy. Oh, wait a minute, there's someone else. A peery, a rose gardener emerging from the hedges, stammering. My ladies, I swear to you I did not intend to spy. Forgive me, I was pruning the hedge and could not find a way to interrupt. We forgive you. But as punishment, I command you to stay and to come closer. But he is a servant, Duchess, and serve us he will, young Amelia. Oh, these, these dirty, dirty theater plays they have here. Oh, I would like to see one of those theater plays in the game, but I don't think that will happen. Right, that's all the books I found so far, and that was a lot of books. And I didn't read the Strixers once. Anyway, um, I will read. I will read books as I go on from here on out, very likely, because that was uh, that was long, long and uh, quite. Wait a minute. They have taken away my... Alright, they must be cleaning it out. Anyway, I will uh, I will continue from here and in, in the next video. And uh, if you watched this far, uh, you uh, <laughs> probably liked the reading of books. But anyway, I will, as mentioned, do it in... Uh, do it as I go along. That was a bit too, bit too long to read them all at once. And that was just... Just the books I found so far. But anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next next video when I think the third mission will start.